this is great. I mean, there's over a thousand people at this conference uh, involved in research and uh, behavior sciences. And I guess the replication crisis is uh, making us all look in the mirror and ask the question, um, is what we're doing actually valid? Does it have robust rigor behind it? Yeah, and if, if it does, why can't we replicate these findings? Now, g getting into this, um, into this, we've got two great speakers, and um, I'm really uh, sort of honored to be here to the chair, but I'm not going to say very much. I'm certainly not going to um, take the time away from Ben Goldacre, who many of you will know, who's from the University of Oxford, who's going to kick us off, and then we're handing over to Dean Carlin from Northwestern. So without any further ado, please welcome Ben to the, to the podium. Hey, thank you. Uh, oh, great, and a clicker too. Um, so thanks for having me. Uh, as always, this conference is a galaxy of stars and none of us are worthy of being here. Um, uh, also, on the way in, I noticed that two out of the six urinals in the gents just out there have got little plastic goals with footballs in them. That's very obviously, I've met people like you before, somebody's misguided PhD project, I suspect, <laughs> and you're monitoring which one I did a wee in. Um, so... Let me tell you very briefly what I do just for context. So I'm a doctor and I trained in medicine 100 million years ago and then psychiatry and then epidemiology at London School of Hygiene, which I know some of you from. Um, and I've slipped sideways into research from clinical medicine and I work in Oxford on two sets of problems. One is better use of public data. So we produce tools like openprescribing.net, which lets you see what every doctor in the country is prescribing. And we do various trials within that as well, which are kind of related to your interests. But I'm also separately interested in reproducibility and in particular in uh, clinical trials. And so what I'm going to walk you through today is really um, a kind of overview of the things that have gone wrong in the work that we've done in medicine around clinical trials and uh, advice on how to avoid replicating those problems in your own community. Um, and I'm also kind of deliberately not going to touch very much on specific policy trials or behavioural intervention trials, even though I know a few sketchy ones here and there, because if I do that, you'll all get distracted and you'll only be able to think about the specific interventions being tested. So... First up, uh, you've got to make sure all trials are registered and all trials are reported. This matters because in medicine we don't rely on the results of one clinical trial. We know that there's lots of variation in the results. That's partly due to sheer random noise and sampling error, but it may also be due to subtle non-random effects. It may be differences in the intervention being tested and so on. And so we need to add together all of the results of all the trials that have been done on one given question in order to get the best overall result. And this is the logo of the Cochrane Collaboration. That's a forest plot, that's what you get when you add them all up. It's actually humbling and worrying to think about how recently this notion was invented, long after we started doing trials, and large numbers of people have been injured or died needlessly, not because we didn't have the evidence, but because we didn't have the sense to synthesise it all in one place, which is much cheaper. But you cannot synthesise evidence if lots of it is missing. In medicine, we know that trial results commonly go missing. This is Raboxetine, a drug I myself have prescribed. I prescribed it after looking it up on PubMed. I found a couple of trials showing it was pretty good. Little did I know at the time that the German cost-effectiveness uh, regulator, ICWIG, were in a battle with the company. Turned out that almost all of the unflattering trial results on this drug were withheld. How often does that happen? Well, very commonly. So there are cohort studies on this question done so often in medicine that there are now systematic reviews of them. This is one looking at all the trials done on antidepressants um, before they came to market, so it's an unusual situation where you can actually find out what the results were if you dig into the FDA archives. For more on that, just send me an email. I'm happy to, to share all the references. You can have all the notes. But overall, they found that in the FDA archives, about half the trials had positive results, half the trials had negative. When they went and looked in the publicly accessible stuff, the academic journal articles that doctors and payers use to make choices about which treatments are effective. Stark difference. First of all, 36 negative results turned into three negative results, so almost all the trials with negative results went missing in action. Almost more interestingly, 38 positive results turned into 48 positive results. Well, how do you do that? Uh, anybody who's ever analysed data will know. It's the lesson of Guantanamo Bay. If you torture the data hard enough, it will confess to anything. So you can switch your primary outcomes, you can do non-pre-specified subgroup analyses, you can play fast and loose in how you produce, uh, how you exclude 
include outliers. You can decide that you're going to do a complicated regression analysis with lots and lots of different factors in the model. And, oh, it's not quite hit peak with 0.05, but maybe if we recategorized age as five-year bands instead of quintiles. Let's see what happens there. The corridors of academia echo with these discussions that are never, ever captured. So that's why it's important that we are rigorous and cautious. So this is a systematic review of all of the trials done on getting a bunch of trials that you know have been conducted and completed and then checking if they've been reported or not. Overall, depending on how long you give people to report, what your criteria for reporting are, it tends to come out that about half of all trials don't get reported. There have been laws on this. The compliance with them is woefully poor about one in five for the FDA Amendments Act in 2012. That's exactly the same finding, but five years later in a Nedgen paper, we set up a thing called the All Trials Campaign, which asked for all trials to be registered and reported. And we don't just think that you should register and report trials. We don't just say that. We just want people to say that. You also have to monitor the compliance, and you don't get that for magic beans. You have to pay people to monitor compliance. I'm very lucky we were paid to monitor compliance, although that money runs out in... 55 days, we will not close our projects down. Um, so this is paper in the BMJ on uh, pharma companies' transparency policies and a website ranking them and scoring them. This is the same for non-pharma trial sponsors published in JAMA. And you can see here, first of all, there's huge variation in people's trials transparency policies. Lots of funders, lots of companies don't even really have a very robust policy requiring you to register your trials and report results. Uh, but secondly, this is important for you, if you want to do this kind of research in your own field, you get really high impact publications. Look, BMJ, JAMA. It's worth it. So, uh, next, we also do compliance with reporting, so not just policy, but actually did people report. And if you go to eu.trialstracker.net, you can see that we've got live data for every individual sponsor and every individual trial conducted on any investigational medical product in Europe since 2004. And you can see which universities and drug companies are particularly good or particularly bad at reporting their results. And we've done the same for US trials. And every day this data updates and every day we show which trials have breached. So you have to not just say all trials registered and reported, you have to monitor compliance. You have to check whether trials have been registered, check whether trials have been reported. Next up, you want to make sure that trials are reported properly and in full. So in medicine, we know now that actually medical journals, academic journals, are not very good places to report the results of scientific experiments. They allow you to play fast and loose in how you uh, report your study. You can leave details out. They often don't require you to share your code or even a full description of your methods, let alone your results. And there are lots of papers now. This is one showing that clinical study reports, which are regulatory documents, often thousands of pages long, are unsurprisingly more complete than academic journal articles when you compare the two documents for the same trial. And particularly worryingly, uh, there are huge discrepancies on adverse events and serious adverse events. We know that this from specific examples as well. So Tamiflu has quite uh, arbitrarily become the poster child for transparency around clinical trials in medicine. And the Cochrane Review, when they finally got the clinical study reports, they found, for example, methodological flaws like... Um, so in trials trying to see if Tamiflu was preventing uh, pneumonia, they found that the diagnostic criteria for pneumonia were self-report. Not chest x-ray, not clinician diagnosis. The patient saying, oh, yeah, I had pneumonia, doctor. Now, I'm a man. I'm vulnerable to man flu. If I wake up feeling tired, I've got cancer, leukemia, AIDS. You know, you do not rely on self-report for pneumonia. Next, uh, you've got to share your data. So this happens. It is wrong when people say, oh, that's completely impossible. You know, this is very difficult, and there are information governance reasons. It's as, it's as every day as commonplace as anything else we do in medicine. This is uh, individual patient data meta-analysis on all the trials ever done on early breast cancer uh, trials. That's what real science looks like. That's all of the authors all put together into one giant paper. Um, this is the first uh, individual patient data meta-analysis I'm aware of. It's in the Lancet in 1970. So nobody can say that sharing data for individual patients patient data meta-analysis is unusual or new or weird or hard. Um, and we also do it all the time. So this is the form that I have to fill out if I want to get some GP data to do research on it. It's a bit of a bore, but you can get it. We get individual participant data all the time for research, and that is not a barrier to sharing for the purposes of reproducibility and replication. Next up, you've got to share your analytic code. 
as I said earlier, if you torture the data hard enough, it will confess to anything. Now, a minor dig. Uh, this is a trial which I was very peripherally involved in the chats around um, on uh, comparing nudge letters for, or versus nothing, by the way. It's not fantastic. But nudge letter versus nothing to see if that changes antibiotic prescribing behavior. Now, we do similar trials in our openprescribing.network. We wanted to see how they analyzed their data. We read the methods section in full, and I got professors of statistics to read it in full. You know, I write my own code, I mean, but you know, wanted a second look, and we could not work out for love or money how they analysed their data, how they built their model. Not sure it should have been a regression model in the first place, but these are cultural differences between my field and yours that I've discussed a lot with Dean in the past. You love doing regression models, especially in economics. You consider the randomization to be just one of many terms in your model. Fine, but that exposes you to so much p-hacking and also the challenge of whether or not it can be reproduced at all, your analysis. Um, so uh, you might say we well, just ask people for it. I do that from time to time. I'm friendly, I'm not, I'm very polite, but people can be quite hostile um, when you ask. This is not necessarily an example of somebody being hostile, but you can judge for yourself how helpful they were. Uh, this was a very famous analysis published in the BMJ showing that um, if patients pitched up at hospital unwell at the weekend, they were more likely to die. Everybody was worried that there might be confounders here because people who pitch up at hospital at the weekend are probably going to be more ill to start with. So it was important to know whether or not you could reproduce the analysis. The paper itself was just an analysis essay it wasn't even a piece of original research in the BMJ so I wrote a thing saying we should you should could you share your code and then we could see it because the data that they were working on was HES which is freely accessible to any researcher who just fills out the form and gets it so if we could, with the data sharing is handled just give us the analytic code and we can check that we get the same results that you did we can check all of the tiny assumptions that I made do you check for interaction terms how did you do was that a linear variable was it ordinal categorical all of the decisions the tiny decisions that you make that can all add up. Um, and the response that I got said things like uh, oh this is bad science that's a humorous reference to a book that I wrote 100 million years ago um, and he says oh we've asked a senior colleague to look over our stuff it's fine and look if we shared it's lots of SQL and SAS programs they'd cover many pages of information um, and that's just not okay in, in, in my view now I would never necessarily criticize an individual for exhibiting what is a broader cultural flaw but I think it's really unhealthy and the best we can do is to make it the norm to share your code as well as your data just to be clear again this is the same argument in 2015 and this is the same argument in 1994, and so it goes. So these are not new arguments, and it's about time that we had them fixed, and there is a good fix. Jupyter Notebooks, you can share the text description of what you've done, your code, and your outputs alongside your data, and that is an absolutely complete description of everything that you did. That's a How to Do It paper from Nature on why they're good. This is one of ours, and in my group, this is what we do for every single paper that we publish. We share the code, the data, and the narrative alongside it. And here's one from a Lancet Psychiatry paper on opioid prescribing trends there. And over the last couple of years, we've shared about 140 Jupyter notebooks as well as 44,000 lines of code. Share your code. If you share your code, then there's no question about whether anybody can reproduce it. They just take your code, they take your data, they run it. It either works or it doesn't. And if they're worried about whether you did it right, then they've just got the code right there in front of them. Next, you've got to facilitate critical commentary. Um, so it's very common in medicine for trials to be misreported. People pre-specify their primary outcomes, and then when the paper comes to be published, you find that the ones that were pre-specified aren't actually being reported, and the ones that are being reported are not actually pre-specified. And... In the consult guidelines, which are endorsed by over 530 medical journals to date, they say when you're reporting trials, if you do have to switch, you shouldn't, but if you do have to switch, that's okay. We understand these things happen, but you just have to disclose that you've switched in order to be compliant with the consult guidelines, which are the universal gold standard. So we ran something called the Compare Trials Project. There have been about 30 papers published showing that trial journals actually don't comply with consort, even though they say that they will. So we didn't want to do just another cohort study. We wanted to find out why. So for every trial published in the big five journals over the course of six weeks, we took every single trial, analysed it in real time immediately that day, and we sent a correction letter within seven days to the journal if they had misreported their clinical trial. Out of 67 trials, 58 required a correction letter, what do you think happened when we sent them into the journals? 
I mean, we were testing the, 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 the self-correcting processes of science, really. That was our objective. And you can see here that uh, up at the top, only 23 out of 58 letters were published. There was a median delay to publication of 104 days. Um, and also, the responses that we got from trialists were often um, really very dismissive, in some cases quite hostile, and in many cases made statements that were completely untrue about either their own trial or about how you report trials correctly. So that shows, it's not about catching people out, that shows how deeply ingrained these problems are. So do not reproduce our failures in medicine. Um, and just very finally, uh, an example of why that matters. Um, in November, a few months ago, I, I went along to Institute for Government where there was a discussion about trials in government and one of the trials that was pulled up, and this really is just an arbitrary selection, was this one. It's a trial of um, some English language teaching and while the panellists were presenting it, I was Googling and having a look, seeing if I could find the paper. Now, I found some problems with the paper. First up, um, 65 pages long. Here's the abstract. There are no numbers in the abstract. No numbers about the results at all. That's really unhelpful. You should have structured abstracts. Um, but that's a minor issue. There was no evidence of prior registration. The effect sizes, which are so reasonable, had very low p-values but no confidence interval. That's no way to report trials because you can get very tiny p-values with very large numbers. But, yeah, I want to see confidence intervals. Also, uh, my biggest concern really was that it was a bespoke outcome measure. So if you're measuring the impact of English language teaching, you might use a standard outcome measure for English language ability. But instead, they were doing test exactly what you taught, which can be very different to test real-world performance. Now, we would always expect there to be a bit of a, uh, a rag bag of methodological flaws and reporting shortcomings in any clinical trial. What was really concerning and interesting to me here was that this was reported only on a .gov.uk webpage, and there was no way for me to talk back to it. There was no way for me to share these concerns. And that kind of linked critical commentary is a really important part of, um, of keeping your game high. I should stop talking very soon, shouldn't I? Um, OK, so um, alongside all of that, there's obviously the, the more newsworthy issue of replications and reanalyses. There's been a rash of these in uh, psychology, as I'm sure you'll all know, and the reproducibility rate is commonly very low. And this commonly produces, importantly, uncomfortable social situations. Now, um, that's something that is a kind of professional matter. It's important to be aware when professional matters are, are perhaps being turned into personal matters. In, in our group, we often um, we do research which, to an extent, does bring you into Perhaps conflict, if you're, if you're publishing something that is reasonably and fairly conservatively critical. Um, and we talk a lot about being uh, fearless without being reckless. But it is unpleasant. It's, it's a difficult thing to do, and that explains why it is not done. Now, I don't mention that particularly in, response, in, in, in reflection on our own work, but really on some of the great work that's been done by people like um, uh, NOSEC and the Open Science Framework and the Reproducibility Project, where if you look online, you will find some of the critical commentary from some of the people whose work didn't reproduce is really unkind. Uh, so... You've got to facilitate replications and reanalyses. You've got to reward them. You've got to make sure they do get published. And all too often you see stories of journals failing to uh, uh, rejecting reanalyses and reproducibility studies on the grounds that they're not novel. That's, that's a, a disappointing worldview. But also, more importantly, you have to pay for it. None of this happens by magic. And you can't get any of this stuff done um, well, you can't get any of this stuff done with magic beans. And just very, very finally, um, the way that academia works, the way that research works, is these kind of individual city-states of individual projects. You can get one trial funded. And actually trials, because they're so administratively burdensome, they often require that you employ a lot of people to manage all of that admin, and that in turn brings a degree of political power in your organisation because you've got quite a lot of staff. Similar to the way that in psychology departments, people who do MRI experiments require huge teams, so they have somewhat more kind of soft social power than the people who do pen and paper psychophysics experiments, even if they get those published in nature. Trials require big teams, and they do get big money. The supporting structure around those trials 
is almost entirely unfunded. We've left the reporting of research in general to this weird ad hoc ecosystem of academic journals, which are clearly no longer fit for purpose in so many ways, not just fleecing the money, but also not doing the job of ensuring that things are correctly reported and not facilitating post-publication peer review. But also, it is an enormous struggle to get even something as simple as trials registers uh, up and running. So my question to you all would be, in your field, are all trials registered and reported? Can you show me data where people have checked that all trials in your field were registered and that all trials in your field were reported? Are all trials reported in full? And can you point me to papers where people have checked that all trials were reported correctly and in full and how people responded to corrections if they were not? Do people share their data? And how often does that happen? That's a very straightforward thing to do a cohort study on. Do people share their analytic code? Again, that's a very simple thing to do a study on and to compare. This is about half a dozen PhDs. If anyone's interested, Google me and email me and come and do it. Um, do you facilitate critical commentary? Are your, are your um, research outputs consistently published in places where it's easy for people to talk back about concerns? Do the funders that you work with and whose panels you sit on facilitate and reward replications and reproducibility? But for all of this, do you know... Can you point to, have you advocated for, the pots of money to make sure it happens and the systems that check their performance? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great, perfect. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dean now, but as he's walking across, I should have mentioned there's this, uh, there's this technology of Slido, if you've come across it, I hope you've seen it, which allows you to raise questions, which we'll use later on for the Q&A. So... Um, Please look at that if you want to raise some questions. Dean. Is there a clicker? He's taken the clicker, clicker with him. <coughs> ah, great. I didn't want you to talk back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. So um, this is actually a lot of fun on a personal level, so I appreciate your Brexit for allowing me to be here. For those of you who don't realize, that is why I'm here. Um, that's why Rachel Glenister is not here, and you have to put up with me instead. Um, so that's added to your list of unintended negative consequences that voters did not think about in 2016. <laughs> um, um, but the second one is actually a lot of fun. Um, ben and I met on, via Twitter many years ago, and, so, um, and I've been a big fan of his ever since, used his, some of his videos for homeschooling my children in 2011. They learned all about placebos through Ben Goldacre's really fast-talking British voice that I had to keep pressing pause and rewind and let them listen to it again. And, th and so we basically went through three iterations. Once, a second one so they could actually understand, and then a third one so I could explain. <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, I have two thoughts that I want to make just as an immediate segue to what Ben just presented about, and then I'm going to talk about things that are obviously related but a, a bit different. The first is to say that um, that I, I don't think there's a single thing that he uttered that I disagree with, so you're not going to find us at any point if you're thinking there might be some disagreement that is illuminating, you know, don't, don't expect that. Um, the second th thing to say is I think the biggest rub, you know, everything he said, obviously we're listening to, and it's like, duh, right? So why the rub in, in, you know, in a lot of the things that I think we're hearing about at this conference and that um, the world of behavioral economics is, is doing when engaged in, in, in some of these trials in the real world, and this is you know, at the heart of what the behavioral insight team is doing, is that a lot of it is on that nexus between private science and an attempt to generate public knowledge. Now, in the pharmaceutical space, right, it's, it's kind of unambiguous that there's a public cause there. It's, it's usually public funding, but if it's not public funding, it's, it's certainly the public that is going to be at risk of having the wrong answer. And so there's a clear public mandate for doing absolutely everything he just said, right? But there are companies out there that obviously are running randomized trials on their own, their own little things on their websites, things of this nature that's private science, and you do have a world of people, of which many of you, I'm guessing, are in that world. I've, you know, dabbled in it. Um, where there is work between public entities, such as Behavioral Insight Team, such as Innovations for Poverty Action, Jamil Poverty Action Lab, where I'm a part of, and these corporate entities. And then a decision does have to be made. Is that open science or, or private science? And that's, that's a different beast. And certainly there are companies, Google, Amazon, that are going to be running these things for themselves, and they're not going to be registering this stuff. But then if we as researchers are trying to create public knowledge, just you know, realize there is that problem. So, um, and, and as an individual researcher, it actually does cause 
um, a problem to do some things private and some things public, because then how do you know how much is one and how much is the other? Um, which is why many people, myself included, kind of, I mean, it's not, there's no public oath process for this, but you know, do not ever do private science. That way, it's known that there's not, it's not I'm not doing 12 trials and sharing the one. Um, but that's not something that we have. That's not a list there that's a researcher-specific thing, but I think it should be. Okay, so those are my kind of main thoughts to segue. But now, um, why is this, you know, when we think about replication, you know, why is this um, a problem? And, you know, for whom is it a problem? And I think that really comes down to a sub-question, which is why aren't they paying to solve it? Um, the, the challenge of replication. And just, just to be clear, replication obviously was just one piece of what Ben was saying, but that's where I'm going to now focus is on this question about kind of replicated studies um, to understand um, what is the, the true treatment effect from some idea. Um, you know, and fundamentally, that, that comes down to a, a donor problem. And then from a donor problem, that could be government, that could be, that could be foundation. Um, but that is a problem because, you know, if, if they were willing to pay for it, the researchers would be there to do it. They, you know, that would happen. But a lot of times, even foundations or governments are only thinking about a particular program that they're running in a particular place, and they're not thinking about the global question. There are obviously exceptions to that. I'm going to get to a, um, one example in particular of the Ford Foundation that very directly saw that as a problem on its particular intervention and um, worked to address that. Um, why is it a problem with academia? Broadly speaking, I, I think about it as three different issues. One is academia records, cre rewards creativity. And so if someone's stated purpose of a study is to say, hey, I'm just going to do what that person did, I'm going to do it again, there's less of a reward for that because of, because of academia rewarding creativity. Whether that's good or bad, you know, obviously I'm, you know, that does lead to a bad consequence here. The second is about the magnitude of, of the knowledge, right? To the extent that people aspire to get published in higher ranking journals in academia versus lower ranking journals, you know, the bar there is subjective in a lot of cases. There's, some of it is technical, but some of it is subjective about how new is this knowledge and how first order is it versus kind of derivative of some earlier work. And again, if it's, if it's the seventh study of a, something that has already been published six times, um, then the, the nature of our publication reviewing process is to discount that, and that's a problem. There are solutions to these issues, right? But the, this, I'm just pointing out this is kind of the root of the problem from the academic in, um, perspective, and that lies at the, the fundamental tension between the policy world that says, well, I really need to know what to do, I need to know whether this works, and the academic world, which is happy to produce those answers, but at the same time is subject to its own constraints and incentives. Um, and the third comes down to saying, you know, what is new knowledge? Um, and, um, you know, in my view of the world, a replication is, should be, you know, just about rewarded just about the same in the sense that that's still new knowledge. You're learning whether something replicates in the bounds of that, but that does get at the, the heart of the problem, So, which is kind of like the second point. So, um, so one issue about... One thing that we're doing as a, just a, a, as a little, I don't want to say side note, but it is the, the one, one, um, one effort that we have underway at Journal of Development Economics is a pre-results review. Now, pre-results review started about a year ago, and basically the heart of this is you submit a randomized trial that you're doing, you submit your, your plan for it, you submit your theory as to why you're doing this and how it fits into the literature, and you submit all sorts of technical information about your sample sizes and your surveying strategy and your survey instrument and what your specifications will be, and you detail whether you're going to put in age linearly or buckets of five, just like Ben pointed out. And you kind of detail these things, um, and you tie your hands. You even you know, say what your, you know, your primary outcomes, your secondary outcomes, everything. And then the results are what they are. And the point is that the review process, the referees and, and me as the editor and the other editor who handles these papers, we are deciding based on the question and the quality of that question and the quality of the approach to tackle that question, not on the actual answer that they get from the data. And I, the, my first order reason for doing that is actually not relevant for this panel, I'll say, but the second issue is. The first reason for doing that is because a lot of times studies um, don't have, um, you know, have multiple outcomes involved and they don't always work out so perfectly, right? And so a lot of times we see results from a study, suppose the study is doing a cash transfer. Right, well, cash can be used in lots and lots of ways, and so sometimes when you get the results, you're saying, well, I'm going to look at 10 different things to try to understand how did these cash transfers change behavior and change outcomes for households, and you know, income goes up, but consumption doesn't, and you're left scratching your head going, hmm, how can that be? And you, then you have three explanations for why that might be. 
but that's not a picture-perfect understanding of what happened, but that's the real world, and that not everything always lines up so perfectly when the results come out. Right now, if you have a super linear theory of change that's very narrow, this leads to this, leads to this, leads to this, then, then maybe that's less of an issue. But a lot of things don't have that. A lot of things saying this leads to seven different things. And it could be different across people, and so you get a little bit of a mishmash. And the reality is, sadly, we, we, don't, we don't publish those as well in academia as we should. Um, referees will discount them. And obviously, one solution to that is just say, we commit to publishing those, even if, that, even if it looks like that, but we're human. And so one way of getting around our humanness is to say, well, why don't we commit up front based on the question rather than the, the data that come out? And so that's basically like a big commitment device to not do that. Um, the second, though, is it's a bias against, um, reduces bias against replication a bit. And this is just my instinct that it, from a behavioral kind of perspective that it's, that if, if someone has a randomized trial that's saying doing this program generates a 0.3 standard deviation shift in whatever I, you know, my outcome is, and then someone submits um, a paper saying I did a study that is very similar to this other study, and I got 0.28, that a referee's going to go, well, you know, didn't we kind of already know that? They said three, they said 2.8, like about the same, nothing new here. And I think they're much more likely to say that and say, you know, send this to a the journal of replicated studies. And then if, they, if someone is to say, well, these people over there got 0.3, here's a different context. I want to see if this context matters. It's different in these following three ways. This might be important. Let's find out. Let's find out if this was a bust. It's a smaller, smaller sample before. Whatever the case is, and, but if they're making that case up front, my hunch is that it'll be easier to see it, those type of papers get published. So I do see this as um, a potential way of tackling replication bias as well. Um, this is new. It's still in its kind of piloting phase. We have six papers that have made it through the process so far, the first stage, that are accepted for the second round. Um, and, and basically, when you make it through the first stage, you're conditionally accepted. If you send back in um, a paper where you only surveyed 60% of your people in a setting where we know enough about that country to know that you should be able to reach 95%, then the paper can still get rejected if we see things that are way off um, in the data quality, things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> okay, so one thing that I think is true, when I started thinking about this panel in the past 48 hours since... <laughs> since um, um, because of um, um, Rachel not being able to be here. Um, I thought about what does it mean to replicate? Is what, are we, what are we actually talking about when we talk about replication? And my hunch is that in different, diff in outside of economics that we actually are using that term a bit differently. So at least that's my perception from when I've heard that term used in like medical studies and things of this nature. Uh, so to me, as an economist at least, I think of replication as saying, do I have a theory of the world that has some predictions, um, and so it held over here in some paper, and now I'm testing the same theory over here. But that theory doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to get the same average treatment effect when I run a randomized trial. So if I run, if it's some sort of cash transfer program, as an example to go back to, you know, I might have some theory about how people are going to use money and how that's going to change their lives a year or two later, but that doesn't mean when I go to some other context and run a cash transfer program, I expect those same point estimates. I might have some, uh, it, it's going to very much depend on local context and heterogeneity in that population. And so if I have a theory about how people use cash, then maybe in my other context, I can see whether that theory still holds. But I might get very different point estimates depending on what those underlying contextual variables are. And so to me, when I think about replication, what I, what I think of is, I'm replicating a, a study and replicating a set of questions, and it succeeds in replicating the earlier results and kind of confirms the information if the theory is um, not invalidated in the other context. Um, a practical challenge of this in some context, and I've dealt with this only a few times, but you can imagine, um, a, um, I'll go back to one example that Ben and I agreed not to talk about was deworming, but this is the example I always use as deworming for this point I'm making, so I'm going to go with it, is... Um, that you know, deworming has a very, um, you know, one of the key contextual factors to get deworming, in taking an intestinal, a pill to get rid of intestinal worms, which was found to then reduce, um, reduce absenteeism from school, and, and then 20 years later lead to, maybe 15, I think it was, to a higher income for children, well, when they're adults. Um, and, um, but you know, a key contextual factor is that you have worms. Right? Although if you don't have worms, this, this theory of change doesn't, doesn't make sense. Right? So it's not a solution for school absenteeism. You wouldn't take this approach to dealing with absenteeism here in inner city London or inner city New York or Chicago. 
right? Because you need that key contextual factor. So if you want to kind of test that theory, a really stupid thing to do would be to go run a deworming program in inner city London and see that, in fact, it didn't change school absenteeism and see that as kind of supporting your theory. And that's, you know, would be a stupid thing to do. But, you know, so that's an, an extreme example of, you know, in order to test a theory, you kind of need to see where it holds and, and, and that the actual theory does predict when it doesn't work in other contexts. And that doesn't mean go do stupid things, but it does mean push the boundaries um, and look for heterogeneity within studies and within context for when you think it's going to work better and when it's going to work worse for which types of people. And that, that can help get with, um, solve that issue. So what is it that drives variation? Um, and this goes to actually one of the points that I know Kevin is going to um, want to speak about in, in a little bit, which is, um, so if we see two studies get two different results, we want to know why. Was this a failure on the first part about the idea which is kind of the heart of what we're going at. And so we want to know whether this idea is true. And so we see it tested somewhere, and then we scratch our head going, OK, but will it replicate? Or was that a result of publication bias or something of this nature? So what are all the reasons why it might vary? Um, aside from, I should probably add in all the types of um, kind of transparency issues like that, that, that Ben was just talking about. That, that didn't mean to be omitting that from this list. Um, but you know, there could be data quality, data measurement choices, implementation differences. There's just the implementing parties were different um, and ways that could be very important to learn from. Why, why, is, why was there a difference in implementation? And what can we learn then about how to run better implementation? Um, Cross-study contextual heterogeneity. So that would be my deworming example to give a really stupid one. But there's others that are kind of obviously more subtle. Um, but also could make big differences in the way a program works in one setting to another. And then within study heterogeneity, and then, and then alongside differential composition. So, you know, this works better for men versus women, but, um, and in one site has more women than men, and the other site the other way around. And so you get a different average treatment effect that's really about underlying heterogeneity. So understanding and having that part of your theory then makes it so that when you test it in one place and you get the, a different answer in the other, but then you realize, no, it's about underlying heterogeneity in the composition of my two samples, then that's a perfect, that's a replication that succeeds um, and not fails. Okay, so I'm going to give you three examples now. Um, one is from um, commitment savings. The second is, my, these are all development economics examples. The second is microcredit. Third is graduation programs. So um, first is a point that... Um, so when we think about commitment savings, commitment savings can mean a lot of different things. Um, and so we've seen a lot of studies which in some sense are replicating each other. Um, they're always doing something a little bit different, testing out slightly different product designs, trying to understand more about how and why commitment savings may or may not work. A commitment savings account can mean many different things, but in general it means there's some way of either committing to deposit or committing to not withdraw your money until some later point in time. So it can take on many different forms in how it's done. Um, and here's a very simple graph in which we took, um, what is that, 10, I think, 10 studies. And we graphed it on the strength of the commitment feature. How binding was it? Was it easy to kind of get out of the commitment or not? Right? And, and in a very hand-waving way, we're now able to see across the studies um, some, you know, we see a lot of variety, first of all. The bars represent take up and usage. Do they open the account? And then do they use the account? As you can see, usage is often quite a bit lower than take up. It's easy to get someone to say, sure, I'll do that. It's another thing to get them to actually do it and use it. But you do see this, um, this upside down U. Strong commitment can be too much. They say, ooh, that's a bit too much. I want to do this, but you know, I'm not really sure I want to really tie my hands that tightly. On the other hand, no commitment at all doesn't trigger um, change in behavior. So something in the middle might be about right. Um, that's obviously a very hand-waving statement, but this is, you know, if someone didn't think about what is different across these studies, is there a consistent theory here that actually does make this prediction of heterogeneity, then one might look at this result and imagine just reordering this and looking at 10 different bar charts, you'd say, well, this is all over the place. This idea does not replicate, right? But that's not the right way of, I think, thinking about this. You have to think about what is the driver that is driving the heterogeneity across these studies. Um, so Another example from commitment savings comes down to thinking about, well, what is commitment savings generally doing? It's generally saying it's under, the underlying theory is about human behavior and self-control and this idea that we, we have temptations that are right here in front of us right now, um, but savings is for the future, obviously, and 
So the idea is by giving people an opportunity to commit um, to their savings, they're going to reduce some temptation spending and, I, and put more money towards future things which are not tempting that are kind of long-term investments. That's the underlying theory um, that, you know, behind a lot of the, the thinking. There's going to be some other theories one could put forward, too, that it's trying to do that about substitution for different types of savings. But putting that aside, that's a basic idea. So broadly speaking, there's two types of temptation goods, ones I would call innocuous and ones that are in negative externality goods. Innocuous goods would be you know, things that are just the more tempting, um, some tempting consumption goods, things that I like to do, but, you know, but that it's not that it's like, I'm not doing harm to somebody else, but it is something that I would never buy in advance. Right, but right then and there, I, I might buy it. So maybe it's dessert or something like this that I'm tempted by, um, but I wouldn't ever buy it for tomorrow's meal, but I'll buy it right now. The second are the negative externality goods. Typically, we think about tobacco and alcohol in that category. So in, um, in a lot of settings, we've seen commitment savings look at whether it changed behavior of alcohol and tobacco, and we have not seen a shift in that. Um, so to the extent that they were working, it was working through other margins. In Bolivia, we found that alcohol consumption did change as a result of commitment savings. It went up. And this caused us to go back, and you know, we weren't expecting that at first. Um, we probably should have, to be honest, but we weren't. Um, and we went back with our anthropologist friends who were part of the project, and we looked at these results and said, does this make any sense? And then they went back to the field and did a whole long a kind of um, series of focus groups and one-on-one -on -one conversations, sharing the results with back with the communities to help understand what was going on. And the answer came through loud and clear. Yeah, we were saving for alcohol. Like that's our, that was our long-term investment good. We wanted, a, we wanted a commercial bottle. This is, by the way, this wasn't just, um, this wasn't La Paz. This was like um, hunting and gathering communities deep in the Amazon. Um, some places were about 16 hours from a market. Um, so this is really um, autarkic societies. And for them, a lot of instances were like, yeah, the, the, the indivisible good that I'm saving up for is to take that 16-hour boat ride with some friends, go into the market, and have a nice weekend. And when we do that, yes, we buy a bottle of liquor. Um, and that's what we're saving up for. Um, and so there, yeah. OK, one minute, OK. So there, the point is the, the replication holds because the idea is we just had to rethink what we meant by temptation good and the long-term good. And then the, the, the commitment still was good. It just didn't get the result that was initially intended. OK, so now I'll go, I'm going to now give the micro credit in graduation, but I'll do them quickly. That's OK. Um, so, um, so one of the two different areas within economics, in development economics, where we've seen a lot of replication studies that are very, very similar and did lead to actually what I think of as strikingly similar results across. Now, there's differences, and they're, they're important to understand, but I'm not going to highlight those. I'm going to highlight this, the commonality. So first of all, this is, the, this is results from Rachel Meager's paper in 2019 that looked at seven different randomized trials in microcredit. Um, and as you can, this is pooling across the, the seven studies on these different treatment effects and finding fairly consistent, pretty close to zero null effects for improving things that we think of as poverty. Here's the results across the six. And the thing that's interesting to note is look at the green versus the red. The green is the kind of unpooled, not analyzed in any sort of holistic framework that she was using, using Bayesian hierarchical modeling and just looking at the seven point estimates. And then Red says, no, 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 let's look at the data altogether and try to understand what is the commonality here and, and, um, that we're finding and, and, and how much, what can we actually attribute to each individual studies um, and, and come up with a better estimate for each study. And here you see striking similarity across all seven studies um, for this. I think this was the impact on consumption. Um, and then if you see a split by prior business status, this gets at what I was referring to with having some theory about what's going on underlying it to create heterogeneity, you actually see a fairly similar pattern where people who um, had prior businesses tend to be doing better, people without or not. And so you do, see, you do see the same exact pattern within on that dimension. So this is actually a real, a real showcase for successful replication where we're seeing seven studies Different authors, different kind of approaches, all randomized trials, seven different countries, finding fairly consistent patterns. Of course, there's differences, too. Um, second example comes from, this is the reference to the Ford Foundation. This is a project of which um, I think six of these sites were sites that, um, that I was involved with and that were published in this paper in Science. This is something that got started by Ford Foundation doing exactly what I referred to in the beginning, as a funder saying, you know what, 
we want to solve this replication problem by just doing a lot of these all at once across the world, and let's see what we learn. And, and I was um, lucky to um, be in touch with them and, and work with them to help lead this effort to do these. So we, there's eight countries that was done in total. Seven of them have been published. Yemen is coming out soon. Um, and these are the results across, which are a pool, so that's not as useful. But here's the results by country. As you can see, there are some differences by country, and I'm not going to go into those details, obviously, because of time. But a lot of the results are strikingly similar on um, income and revenue, um, per capita consumption, food security. We're seeing strikingly consistent results. Cost effectiveness, uh, Honduras did not work. If you want to ask me, ask me later about what, what happened. But the other five, um, consistent, positive cost effectiveness. Um, which leads me to the concluding slide. Do I have time? Is that fine? OK. So five, five angst that relate to this. Um, the first is the simplest. We don't reward this enough. That is a, that is a problem from the donor side of funding it, but it is also a problem in academia. And there are things that can be done to try to shift that and reward this more. We, pum we punish confusing results. This is the point I was making that we're trying to deal with with the JDE pre results review. We also expect too much of any one study. That's a reality. It's an unfortunate reality that there's a lot of, there's a basic tension um, of a short paper that we talked about this called Catch-22. Um, the, the tension basically is that theory, which is what generally generates the external validity when we have some underlying understanding about why something is working or not, but that usually either forces you to want really small focus studies that are very controlled and in a narrow context so that you can really cleanly say what the context is. It's not just you know, 10,000 people in this country that are going to be very different, but it's, you know, it's not just firms. It's going to be tailors. It's going to be very specific, and so that you can really get in the box, and then you can say something crisp about the theory of what's happening. But then it's also narrow when you do that, and then you lose relevance. So there's a trade-off here, relevance being, I want to say something about policies for firms in Ghana. But the study was only on tailors. What can I learn from that that's relevant for other types of firms? And so there's a tension there for, between theory and, and relevance that we need. And, and as a result of that, I, I do fear that we find ourselves expecting too much from any one study, and that the real lessons that can be learned are going to come that are much stronger and more robust from looking at a set of studies that are all asking similar questions. Um, entre entrepreneurship training is a poster child for this, this, this the, what we used for that Catch-22 paper. Um, and, you know, but the, the point of this takeaway should just be that there are point estimates all over the place. Depending on um, lots of different factors, you can get positive, negative, and nulls on entrepreneurship training programs. It doesn't mean there's no generalized lesson, but we need a lot more understanding. So the fourth and fifth is, you know, we need to know whether replications fail because of the idea or the data. And there's not enough work that is being done on data quality, um, data methods, commonality of measurement. It's not as rewarded, and it should be. We're, we are working hard on this at Innovations for Poverty Action, IPA, and as well as the lab that we have at Northwestern. Um, GPRO stands for Global Poverty Research Lab. There was a huge push within economics that many of you are aware of about doing randomized trials. It started up about 20 years ago, um, and that's great. But data quality matter, too. If we have randomized trials with bad data, you still have a bad study. If you have great data and no good identification strategy, you, you also have a problem. So we need both. Um, and then lastly, and this hits, at, I think, the point I know Kevin wants to come to, is replication failed because of idea or implementation? Operation and implementations are key here. We need to understand more about implementation at scale. Going back to graduation, I'll give you one tiny example, and then I'm done, which is that program, one of the components of that program that I was sharing with you involved house-to-house -house visits for two years with households. Well, one of the things that we're seeing very quickly is that when we did that study, it was done at fairly large scale. But still, you only had to hire about 30 people, usually, per site to do that household visit. Sometimes we're talking with government saying, hey, look at this program. This is great. You could use this for social protection for your country as a whole. They're turning to us and saying, well, that's great. And we can hire 30 just like you did. But to do this at scale, we need, we need 3,000 or 300. We need a lot more people. And I don't know how we're going to find that many people who can do those household visits and where we really have clarity and confidence of the fidelity of what's happening in those household visits, that it's really serving that same role about life, life skills support that you're trying to provide as part of that program. And so that's a challenge for implementing at scale if the, the human capital of your labor supply pool is not as deep or you don't have a good way of screening it um, as you do um, when you only need to find 30 people. <laughs>
So that's just an example of where you might find a difference when doing something for, in our in situation, you know, 100 villages versus trying to do it in 10,000 villages. Thank you very, very much, Dean. Thank you. One of the, um, one of the, one of the problems of, of having this, this discussion is that actually you see quickly that actually, you know, when you lift the bonnet, you can have the conversation about the whole of research and evidence from beginning to end is captured in this theme. So I'm, I'm, I apologise for the the time, but I understand why it takes so long to get this laid out. Now, in the voting, in, in the questions that people raise, they're also able to highlight the, um, the questions that are most interesting to others in the room. And, and so what I'm going to do for time is, I think, for me, there were two sections. There's, first of all, better, better research. Part of the, the, the replication crisis, or if, there is such, if that's the right word, is because the fundamental design of the initial study itself was weak, and, we need, and, and that was all laid out. So I want to find a question that relates to doing better research, better evidence, not a case for evidence, but better evidence. And the second half is about, well, actually, in the world, in, in, in the world of uh, the messy, complex world of, say, economics or in education, my background, is there something we need to think more deeply about, or how do you carry things into different contexts? Is it legitimate to say, actually, you might have to understand why you get different outcomes, as Dean was putting out, in different contexts, and that isn't about replication, it's about the nature of what we do. So I'm going to highlight a couple of questions. The first one, um, the most popular, of course, question comes from the anonymous, who's been really, really busy. But one of the questions I want is the one, oh, I've got them here, I've got them there, is um, to, to both very quickly have to do these. Um, psychologists' long um, excuse of replication, or the value of them, has been caused by contextual changes. To what extent is that an, a valid excuse for the failure to replicate? So when you see that findings don't replicate between two different studies, there are drivers of that that you can modify and drivers of that that you can't. So the context being different, you, you cannot change, and that may actually be one of the things that you're exploring. The intervention being different, that's interesting because sometimes you've deliberately made the intervention slightly different. Sometimes because somebody really wanted to test their own proprietary intervention, instead of sensibly trying to replicate somebody else's intervention with an open, good heart, instead they tested something which was very slightly different for no good reason, and then that can be used for a reason why it didn't replicate. But alongside that, there are lots of reasons for things to not reproduce that you can modify, like everything that I talked about, you know, have, using consistent outcome measures. And in medicine, we have Comet, which is a list of um, uh, the best outcome measures to use in any given disease that have been validated with patients. You can address selective outcome reporting, whether it's whole study non-reporting or individual outcome reporting. You can address p-hacking. If you do all of that, then you're left with only the differences that are true differences... And I think one of the important kind of cultural backdrops to why we've been so permissive about bad research in medicine and psychology and elsewhere is that in physics or chemistry, reproducibility is a pretty binary issue. Somebody says they've done something and they got this outcome. You try and do it. If it doesn't work, then one of you is definitely wrong. Whereas complex biological and social and psychological systems... You often don't reproduce just because of random noise, because yep. of all these other differences. And I think that gives cover. That, that endogenous chaos gives cover to people working in those fields to go, well, God, you know, things often don't reproduce anyway, so maybe we can give ourselves a bit of a free pass for not trying to fix the problems that we can so, fix. Dean, can I take that a bit further with you and say, given all of that, and there's a bit of a, a risk here, we all end up saying the same things, to solve the problem... We look at ourselves as researchers uh, and try and make sure we do better work, as, you, all, as you've laid out in Ben's list and your work. What would you say about the, if you like, research economy or the system we work in that needs to change um, in order to support us to do this kind of work? Are you seeing signs? Are you seeing any indications that the system is supporting research to do this kind of work? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think we are. I mean, we're seeing pushes for exactly the types of things that Ben is, um, ben is advocating for. Um, and there's been, you know, the, the American Economic Association lead journals do not, will not accept a randomized trial if it hasn't been registered. Like, you mm. can't, it has to be, you know, it's required. Um, there's journals that require data being published um, as part of the publication process. So, in, so we are seeing a lot of progress made. I think on the funder side, for funding some of the replications, that's still something that there's only a few players that are excited about that. 
I think it's helpful. I think of. I think it's helpful also to think. Going back to your your first question, the first question is, I think it's helpful to divide up the world of why we're not seeing replication in like in the psychology question you asked to either sloppy, and by sloppy I'm being generous, and that mm. it could also be ethics, versus shallow. So sloppy slash unethical would be, you know, failure to um, properly detail the protocols that you did in a laboratory psychology experiment, um, doing basically failed to do all the things Ben is advocating for, right? So I'll call that generously sloppiness and ungenerously unethical, right? It, to fail you to document that stuff so that someone else can just do it and yeah. know exactly what is it. The shallow is, I think, more of a real world um, experiment issue, um, I, I'd like to think. <laughs> and that is, sh by shallow I mean didn't really think through what are the underlying contextual factors that are going to drive whether this works or not. I don't get to control everything as a real world experimenter, See, I but they're there, so I need to know what they are, identify I, them, and think about how they could influence yeah, and the I results. And I kind of buy that, and, and I buy that, but as long as we've covered off the first issue. Mm -hmm. no, we need um, and, yeah. and, and for those of us, my, my job is I, I, I lead an organization which has supported or funded 200 studies involving half of England schools, just over a million children or so. I'm about to do the same with youth crime with another big fund from the Home Office. And what's interesting for me is the list that you had, Ben, as some of my colleagues are here, we literally would not fund something that we couldn't tick every box on that list. So when, when we started this work in education, we were kind of... Um, nervous about the big beast in medicine. And now I'm trying to work out, well, it's, this is, these are adults' decisions about whether you allow a piece of work to go ahead unless they meet this criteria. This can be done. Uh, and if it's not done, my risk is, m my fear is, not only do we end up doing bad work, which is dangerous, but we end up undermining, I think, what is more important in many ways for me, the steps we've taken to create more... Uh, demand for reason, for science, for evidence in the decision-making. And the whole edifice, in terms of my world, where it's emerging in education, could be lost because we can't do it properly or do it well. Uh, and that's so galling, but it can be done. It, they are decisions that you make. Then you come to the second-order question, which is now we get into the more complex question of all that's covered off, and now we have to think harder about the, the messy, noisy world we're in and why things might be different and why outcomes might be different. But the failure to do certain things seems to me to be inexcus inexcusable. I think what's interesting is that in some places, all of those structural fixes for bad science are very well implemented. And as you know, I think that EEF is, is one example of where it's done in a systematic and structured way. And then in other places, it's a bit more ad hoc. So, yes, there are journals that won't publish unless you've registered, but... Um, you know, not the behavioural insights team in, in London, uh, there's no register of all the trials that they've done, um, and that's something that I've been hammering on about forever. No, and and, they're, they're and you that... could say the same for lots yep. of the groups here. Yep. Um, so, and so, I think it's about taking a systematic construction. So, so to conclude, I, um, as of time, I did promise I'd, I'd very much like to uh, thank the two speakers and suggest that what we all do as researchers, and I'm sure you won't need to do this yourself, but we now just go and look in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we doing the things that need to be done to create really great evidence, as well as building evidence where we, we might face these risks and crises later on? Thank you very much, Dean, and thank you very much. <laughs>